My background as a journalist started in 2002 when I joined Newsweek, and I worked in the New York office for about three years until they sent me overseas. And overseas, I was first in Iraq and then was able to also go to Israel, Vietnam, but I was primarily in Baghdad. I first arrived in Baghdad in August 2005. It was two months after I had met Andy, the girl who I had fallen in love with and who I was planning to marry. I had met her in New York, and then two months later I went to Baghdad. And when I got to Baghdad in August 2005, it was one of those lulls in the war where the attention really wasn't on the war at all, and not many other journalists really wanted to go at that time, so I was able to get there. My assignment was to cover the war, and that was either covering the day-to-day -day political events with the Iraqi government, but also I spent a lot of the time on embeds with the American troops. As I think most people know, you know, long-distance relationships are tough no matter where you are, and when one of the couple is in a war zone and the other isn't, uh, that adds an extra element of stress, to say the least. We knew that we wanted to have a very serious relationship quite quickly, and it was difficult for us because I would be overseas for two months at a time. I'd be in Baghdad for two months, and then I'd be back in New York for two months. And the question was, you know, that two months when I was away and she was in New York and I was in Baghdad, how could we uh, handle that and would our relationship be able to survive that? On January 17, 2007, Andy, who had at that time got a job in Baghdad as well, was on a trip to the Iraqi Islamic Party. Uh, she was working for the National Democratic Institute to help the Iraqi people build their government. And on this trip there, when she was leaving the headquarters, she was attacked and she was killed with three of her bodyguards in a pretty brutal ambush. I was in Baghdad at the time, and after I received the news, which was the most horrible news I'd ever received in my entire life, I then realized I needed to find out what actually happened to her while I was still in Iraq and before I flew back with her remains to the United States for her funeral. So in those five days while we were trying to get out of Baghdad, I started looking into what happened, interviewed one of the survivors, interviewed my sources in Iraq, and then by the time I got home and I'd gone to Ohio for her funeral with her, her family, I was so devastated by what had happened and I wasn't allowed to go back to work because uh, my work was in Baghdad and Newsweek wanted for me to wait a little bit before I went back. So I started to write. I was up in Vermont at the time and I knew that you know, I had to tell this story. It was, ne it was never a choice. It was just something I had to do and I just started doing it. It was almost instinct this kind of survival instinct to kick in, and I just started writing every day in the month of February, a few weeks after she was killed. And I didn't know if it was ever going to be a book or if there was going to be interest in the story or, or what I was writing about, but I knew Andy would have wanted me to make sure her death wasn't a waste. I knew I needed to remember her, and I, I, wanted, I didn't want anyone to forget her, uh, like so many of the other people who have been killed in the war, whether the thousands of Americans or the tens of thousands of Iraqis that have been killed. So I started to write. After a month of writing while I was on my way back to Iraq, I stopped in New York and was able to find the great people at Scribner who uh, really supported the book and seemed to be very interested in allowing me to tell Andy's story. I think the writing was the way for me to make sense of what happened. Because I essentially believe what happened was totally senseless and a huge waste of a beautiful life. But by writing, it was a way for me to understand for myself what happened at the same time to ensure that Andy wouldn't be forgotten. Cathartic is the word. It was a therapeutic or cathartic. I think at some points along the way, it was. But I didn't even remember what I wrote the first month of my writing. I, I just wrote. And uh, a couple months later, when I went back to kind of finish the book and do the rewriting and editing process, I had forgotten huge chunks that I'd written and was kind of shocked to see how much I'd actually written already because I was in such shock when I had uh, written it. I was really, really angry and upset and bitter, and I wanted to capture that emotion in the book. I didn't want this to be a book of policy analysis and 
you know, this kind of intellectual exercise. For me, the war is not an intellectual exercise. The war and what happened, the consequences of it are my life. And I wanted to make the reader feel that. I wanted to capture the rage I had, the rage that this war has caused, and kind of put it on paper so at the end of the time you finish reading the book, you'll feel like you've been punched in the gut. You'll feel like your brain has been smashed and said, oh my God, this is real. These headlines we see on TV, so disembodied from any concrete reality of our own lives, you know, there's real suffering going on. And so that was the point of the book from the title, The Lost Love in Baghdad, which was meant to be this dramatic, unironic title that kind of cut through the noise. But it was also this kind of darkly ironic title because of the idea of love in Baghdad. But the whole vision for this and for remembering Andy was to write a book that was about what it felt like to be there, you know, what, what I saw, what I heard, how it felt to give some emotion and feeling to this war that it so often seems so distant.